think I'm probably going to try to read three poems. This one is titled In the Pasture. Um, I was thinking of a number of things when I wrote it, including the fate of Mandelstam, um, the sensation of oppression in general. Sometimes um, I can't see any of you, so I'm talking to you very much in general. Um, <laughs> You probably all know someone who is being killed by life, but not, it's not yet fatal and doesn't even have a disease. Um, this is an elegy to uh, a person I love very much who's um, lacking the instruction manual. <laughs> that was it. That was the funny part. <laughs> In the pasture. What am I supposed to put now into the sea of fulfillment? The broken record of swaying plenitudes. I press out hard along the hurt, the campaign road. I press my thoughts, my tiny informers. The earth curves more than I had thought at first. My mind, my thoughts in uniforms, I press them out like little hieroglyphs onto the mudslide where the clods and lips are moving now. Who will you be? Who will you, what will you say when it says, repeat after me? and you can't hear it for the din the black soil makes. You come with your plowshare there in your mouth. It is sharp, it works for free, which sharpens it. It cuts into any distance, freely thinking how good to die. Half out of their minds, the words run fast and hard over the muddy fields, seeking out boundaries, splendid declivities. Who will you be when it comes your turn? When I look up, I see the body of my friend climb up over the hilly rise and redescend. There is an other side. My mind knows this. I see my friend climb down, straight down, into the open where there once was pasture. I see the sunlight beat him down. I see how hard it beats with its clean sticks. I see him going in. It's down, of course, under such loving, into the mound it has prepared for him this golden freedom with its filamentary sticks. Later at night, the fires on the horizon line make clear, splendidly clear, who we must be and who I sleep so badly now, they are. You have to live, something keeps whispering, by day, in sun, under its army's yellowest of boots. And you, it is so prominent the way you walk over this soil, your soil, your mind held up there in its fiery cavity, even the day before yesterday, still sparkling like oxygen in there. Ah, how much room you carry about in you over this field. And tell me, did you volunteer? Are you the last free man alive? Are you so full of life, billowing dresses on the lines, blousy hypotheses the butterflies can make over their field? Can you pick your way among the among and the illustration of and the once still architecture of the grandeur of the sensible, the obvious, the inevitable, the true, the chestnut trees, the clean white napkins folded under there, the stars in the day sky, the petticoat of morning mist and the great coat of frost. What is it my friend will have to find breaking down and breaking down? The earth curves more than we had dreamed. 
the slope cannot be staved against. Rainwaters, the day before, the syllable that grows its root into some tiny sleeping god and makes that great sleep shudder back awake. The last slaves, when will they be alive? The space in the heart, when will it be planted shut, tamped down, choked off with root, with growth, that final thirstless silencing? My friend is lying in the earth. No, my love is in the earth. He's weathering gingerly the hurt of its downslope, so I can't see him anymore from here. Materiality has dwindled. What is it, muddy God, that has increased, therefore, according to your law? The day before, the day before yesterday, appears spruced up here in my cavity, my whole, my grandest architecture of syllabled, form-building, clean, numb-lidded gaze. A book is lying in the dust where we last lay. The grass is bloody under it, but that's a whim of blood, you know, a tiny thirst. What does Paris look like now? The eye darkens and the great cities kneel. The monster of the mind moves easily among its morals, its constant inward sucking curl. The day is measured out in grams of light. The monster measured out in grams of light moves gently over the playing field, dragon of changes and adjustments mightiness of redefining and refinement. I love the uniforms my thoughts are wearing, the heels, the sleeves, the black where nothing disappears. I love the stitching in each breath, thread hard and tight into each breath, holding the great coat on, that we be better looking, elegant informers, so well dressed as to be almost transparent, tender like the pasture, thick and clear like a hole that can be jumped into. Oh, earth, voice, string, gardener, lens. Hear the hard dam in these our syllables. We dare not pray. Hear us as cloth the needle. The low buzz of the trees in constant wind terrifies. The leader here has cheeks shaved clean and can't miss fire because he is enslaved and as God's son is not allowed to miss. Someone bites his cigarette. Someone bites hard and lets himself go, thinking how much he'd like to measure and to draw this hole he's forced into, how much he loves the soil they're shoving now, lovers of poems, of flowerings, of all misdelivered messages down his wide throat. just read this one other poem. In this new book, there, I have a number of guardian angels who speak that, don't worry, they're not New Age angels. And I, I, I think of them as kind of downsized, creatures whose job has been downsized, <laughs> victims of downsizing. Um, they still have all the power to witness and no power to um, intervene. 
Um, I think I'll probably end on this poem unless I have time for one uh, last short one. This one is, um, this guardian angel is the guardian angel of the private life. And um, it, it's supposed to remind us, I mean, it, the poem was written out of making lists and the oppression of list making that um, I think involves most of our daily life. <laughs> At the end, you have to imagine someone like Agamemnon um, or Ulysses setting out, if you were reading the whole book, Ulysses and uh, Agamemnon and Achilles appear kind of in secret throughout it, especially Ulysses, but certainly men um, preparing to set out to engage in a very large enterprise like war. Could be Columbus. All this was written on the next day's list, on which the busyness unfurled its cursive roots, pale but effective, and the long stem of the necessary, the sum of events, built up its tiniest cathedral. Or is it the sum of what takes place? If I lean down to whisper to them down into their gravitational field, where they head busily on into the woods, laying the gifts out one by one onto the path, hoping to be on the air, hoping to please the children, and some gifts overwrapped, and some not wrapped at all, if I stir the wintered ground leaves up from the path, nimbly into a sheet of sun, into an escape root width of sun, mildly gelatinous where wet, though mostly crisp, fluffing them up a bit and up as if to choke the singularity of sun with this jubilation of manyness all through and round these passers-by, just leaves, nothing that can vaporize into a thought, no, a burning bush's worth of spidery, up-ratcheting, tender cling leaves. Oh, if the list gripped hard by the left hand of one, the busyness buried so deep into the puffed-up greenish mind of one, the hurried mind hovering over its rankings, the heart there at the core of the drafting leaves, wet and warm at the zero of the bright mock stairwaying up of the posthumous leaves, the heart formulating its alleyways of discovery, fussing about the integrity of the whole, the heart trying to make time and place seem small, sliding its slim tears into the deep wallet of each new event on the list, then checking it off, oh, the satisfaction, each check a small kiss, an echo of the previous one, off, off it goes, the dry, high-ceilinged obligation, checked off by the fingertips by the small gust called done that swipes the unfinishable's gold hem aside, revealing what might have been, peeling away what should. There are flower pots at their feet. There is fortune telling in the air they breathe. It filters in with its flashlight beam, its holy water tinted air down into the open eyes the lamp black open mouth. Oh, listen to these words I'm spitting out for you. My distance from you makes them louder. Are we all waiting for the phone to ring? Who should it be? What fountain is expected to thrash forth mysteries of morning joy? What quail-like giant tale of promises, pleiades, psalters, plane trees, what parapets peddling forth the invisible into the world of things, turning the list into its spatial form at last, into its archival, many-headed, many-legged colony. Oh, look at you.
What is it you hold back? What piece of time is it the list won't cover? You down there in the theater of operations, you throat of the world so diacritical, are we all waiting for the phone to ring? What will you say? Are you home? Are you expected soon? A wanderer back from break, all your attention focused as if the thinking were an oar. This ship the last of some original fleet. The captain's gone, but some of us who saw the plan drawn out still here who saw the thinking clot up in the bodies of the greater men, who saw them sit in silence while the voices in the other room lit up with passion, itchings, dreams of landings, while the solitary ones, heads in their hands, so still, the idea barely forming at the base of that stillness, the idea like a homesickness starting just to fold and pleat and knot itself out of the manyness, the plan, before it's thought, before it's a done deal or the name you're known by, the men of X, the outcomes of Y, before the mind still gripped hard by the hands that would hold the skull even stiller if they could, that nothing distract, that nothing but the possible be let to filter through, the possible and then the finely filamented hope, the filigree, without the distractions of wonder. O oh, tiny golden spore just filtering in to touch the good idea which taking form begins to twist, coursing for bottom footing, palpating for edge hold, limit, now finally about to rise, about to go into the other room, and yet not having done so yet, not yet, the intake before the credo, before the plan, right at the homesickness, before this list you hold in your exhausted hand. Oh, put it down. on a poem I wrote when I was a wee thing, about the same idea, really, the desire that animates us, that takes us very far in a good way, and then too far. This is um, ma imagining uh, standing in front of Luca Signorelli's resurrection of the body of fresco in the cathedral in Orvieto. Um, it's a resurrection of the body, so the bodies are, bones are coming up from, through the soil and the souls are filtering back down and they're merging at eye level, at soil level, and reforming bodies in order to be judged. <laughs> at Luca Signorelli's resurrection of the body. See how they hurry to enter their bodies, these spirits. Is it better, flesh, that they should hurry so? From above, the green-winged angels blare down trumpets and light, but they don't care. They hurry to congregate. They hurry into speech until it's a marketplace. It is humanity. But still we wonder in the chancel of the dark cathedral, is it better back? The artist has tried to make it so. Each tendon they press to re-enter is perfect. But is it perfection thereafter? pulling themselves up through the soil, into the weightedness, the color, into the eye of the painter. Outside, it is 1500, 
All round the cathedral, streets hurry to open through the wild, silver grasses. The men and women on the cathedral wall do not know how, having come this far, to stop their hurrying. They amble off in groups, in couples. Soon, some are clothed. There is distance. There is perspective. Standing below them in the church in Orvieto, how can we tell them to be stern and brazen and slow, that there is no entrance, only entering? They keep on arriving, wanting names, wanting happiness. In his studio, Luca Signorelli, in the name of God and science and the believable, broke into the body, studying arrival. But the wall of the flesh opens endlessly, its vanishing point so deep and receding, we have yet to find it, to have it stop us. So he cut deeper, graduating slowly from the symbolic to the beautiful. How far is true. When his one son died violently, he had the body brought to him and laid it on the drawing table and stood at a certain distance, awaiting the best possible light, the best depth of day. Then with beauty and care and technique and judgment, cut into shadow, cut into bone and sinew and every pocket in which the cold light pooled. It took him days, that deep caress, cutting, unfastening, until his mind could climb into the open flesh and mend itself. <laughs>